Welcome to the Vintage Ballers Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Carino. And on today's episode, we have Reggie Langhorn joining the show. Reggie was drafted by the Cleveland Browns in 1985 before he spent nine years in the NFL, seven with the infamous 80s Browns. So without further ado, please welcome Reggie Langhorn. I, I want to get started, Reggie, and I want to take it back to your childhood. You know, when did you okay. first fall in love with the game of football? Probably, I, I mean, so I'm from two different communities. Um, my, my home is Virginia. So there's a community where, when my parents were married, we moved to, which is in, in Carrollton, Virginia. And there were some guys there, not really athletes. We did more going through the woods, hunting and things of that nature. Um, but I have you know, 10, 12 cousins. We range from when I was little, we ranged from 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Um, and we all were athletes. Um, and all my older cousins, my uncles were all athletes. And probably since I was, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old, we would play in the backyard. There was no little league football for us. So um, I got a couple of cousins that are older than me. Um, and I got a, three or four of them that are younger than me. So I was kind of in the middle. And, and we competed at pretty much just about everything. Did you have a favorite team or player back then? Well, I used to love Chuck Foreman when he did the spin in Minnesota. I loved uh, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, I hated Pittsburgh, and it seemed like Pittsburgh always beat Minnesota. Um, I, I was a fan of the Raiders for a little while, but probably most of my uh, childhood was the Redskins. I mean, oh, really? okay. from Virginia Redskins was the closest team, and you know, back from uh, the uh, Chris Hamburger and you know, and uh, Charlie Taylor. Um, and Brown as a running back, all those guys, those are the teams that I cheered for. And when did you really, like, so going into high school, you went to Smithfield, correct, in Virginia? Smithfield High School. Okay. Yes. And when did you really, you know, get to the point where you thought, like, okay, I can, I can get to, I can play college football and I could maybe take this to the next level eventually? Was it middle <laughs> school, high school? When did you really kind of realize? No, I, I never it? got there. Um, I, I, I never – so if, if you've never played it and uh, met a professional athlete, never went to those games, um, for kids from my hometown, that's something that's out of range. It, it's not something you think of. You know, kids from around here go to, uh, you know, the, the bigger private schools or go to, you know, the, the Toledo and Ohio State and, you know, some of the schools that are synonymous maybe with, with being able to play in the pros, but I didn't want to go to college. And, and then we had this coach, that showed up at my my high school, my junior year. His name was Joe Bugs. Um, he was he, he still is historic in uh, historically black colleges. Um, and he went to Elizabeth City State University. I had no idea. I didn't have any desire to play college football. I was um, I was about to go into the military in my senior year. I had signed the papers. I was about to go take. Well, I had taken the physical. I was about to sign the papers. And uh, Charles Gray, Skipper Gray, was my best friend in high school. Um, my mother and Joe Bugs um, thought that I had enough to do to, to, to play college ball. So there weren't any major college scholarships, but Joe Bugs was real good at getting a lot of his kids in small black colleges. Um, and he went to Elizabeth City himself. He's a Hall of Famer there. He actually tried out for the Steelers back in the 50s. Um, and, you know, Joe... You know, my mom was like, well, this is an opportunity, you know, you may never get. I mean, I want to go in the military. I want to get away from home. I wanted to be able to travel and experience things. Um, and I didn't really care for school. I, I wasn't a very good student in school. I, I asked my mom five or six years ago, we were sitting around and I said, you know, did you ever help me with, with my homework? She told me I never brought books home. So <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, there you go. Um, and, you know, I... Um, I went to Elizabeth City for a year because the three people that were close to me persuaded me to go there. Um, I, I liked the idea of being in there. Him and his wife took me to a basketball game. I got the college experience, which was the first time I'd really been on a college campus. I didn't know anything about going to college. I had, I had no desire to go to college. Um, and when I got there, I met, you know, there was 32 freshmen that year from all over the Eastern Seaboard. Um, and the guys were pretty cool. I met a lot of guys from Booker T. Washington High School, Norview High School that uh, we played a little bit against them in basketball, but uh, they became my best friends. And they are still friends today. And they were my roommates uh, 
and they were they were best friends with Bruce Smith in high school. He went to Booker T. Washington in Norfolk, and somehow we all became friends, and that's how Bruce and I became friends and remain friends to this day. Wow, I didn't realize that. So, yeah. what are your favorite college memories, and, and what you know at that point? You know, did you think, okay, I have a chance to make it to the NFL? Well, <laughs> again. Um, I hadn't thought about the NFL. I, I mean, like I said, I, I didn't dream like that. I was in ROTC. I had done three years of ROTC and my senior year, they were going to start giving me hundred dollars checks, um, as you know, kind of a stipend for being in the program. And then obviously you sign a contract and once you graduate, you go into, you know, the officer's candidate school. And that's where I was in college. Um, it was 1983 and Elizabeth city plays. Um, Norfolk State University. Um, Ron Bolton, who played here for the Browns uh, during the Cardiac Kid days, was a cornerback. Um, he went to school at Norfolk State. And uh, uh, and I just lit it up that day. It's called the Fish Bowl. Elizabeth City versus Norfolk State. It's a Shriners Bowl. Instead of playing in front of three or 4,000 like normal, there was probably 20,000 people oh. at Foreman Field. Um, and I lit it up. I, I, I had a big day. Um, I think I went for seven, eight catches, 170 some yards. I won the MVP. Uh, and then the USFL was just starting to crank up. Uh, guys were starting to sign in the USFL. You had the, the Herschel Walkers and Jim Kellys. And for our team, it was Gerald McNeil, Mike Johnson, Frank Minifield. Those are the guys that I know now from the, the USFL. Um, and, you know, my senior year, scouts started to come around. And I was like, wow, you know, scouts. I mean, I think that's pretty cool, you know, because I remember being in high school and getting letters from Clemson and North Carolina, you know, big schools, but they never paid me any mind. I, I think they send a million of those things out to every guy that's a senior in high school because uh, no one ever came to talk to me ever. Um, but this was a little different because the NFL and the USFL were in a, a, a bidding war or trying to, you know, get young players from all over the place. Um, the USFL was stealing players from the NFL. I had two guys, uh, Bobby Futrell and uh, Dwight Taylor. They were great cornerbacks. Both of them played corners with me. They were a year ahead of me. And one got drafted in the USFL and one was a uh, was a tryout in the USFL, but they led the nation in interceptions uh, in 1984, I believe, in 1983, 84. And, um, and so the USFL would come and check those guys out. When they were there to watching them, I would stay after practice and run routes to help them out. Or if it was in the springtime, they'd always say, hey, can you help us out? Come run some routes. Um, and, they, and the scouts kept telling me, hey, we'll be back for you. We'll be back for you. And then I, I guess that's when the word got out that I would have a chance. But I never really thought about playing in the NFL. I, I, it just, I always thought guys in the NFL were real, real good, like way beyond what we played football in the CIAA. I knew some guys had excelled in his CIAA and had excelled in small colleges, but I still didn't see myself like that. Um, for me, I just was hanging out with my buddies and playing ball on Saturdays. I didn't work, I didn't lift weights in college. You know, I, I, I just wasn't, you know, I, I, I did what I was supposed to do, but I, I just wasn't the athlete that, I guess what scouts look at, I, I didn't believe that, no. That's interesting, Reggie. Did you know, going into the 85 draft, did you have any idea that you could be drafted or was it something that well, kind of came out of nowhere? I'll tell you when it all turned. It was um, the scouts were coming and, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd go to Pizza Hut. They had, I think for two ninety nine you could get all the pizza, all the pizza you could eat at Pizza Hut. So four, three, four of my buddies, my frat brothers, we'd go to Pizza Hut for three bucks, man. We could eat all the pizza. And then I get back to my room and all of a sudden somebody will come say, hey, man, the Washington Redskins are here or the Miami Dolphins are here or the Boston Breakers. All these different teams that want you to run a 40. I'm like, dude, I just ate nine slices of pizza. <laughs> I mean, but OK, I'll run, you know, and uh and that was the beginning of it because I started to talk to scouts and, you know, people from organizations. And there was this one guy named Dom Anilli. And I used to be able to catch six footballs on a, on a jugs machine and punts. I could catch them, put them on my arm. And he had never seen anyone do that. And there was a game that we played, one of our college games. And he says, you know what, kid, we, we're going to come back and look at you. Well, that was a, the, some of the beginning. And then there was once a, a scout from the Redskins showed up. Um, on campus. And uh, I walked into my head coach's uh, uh, Thurlis Little's office, and it was a guy from the Redskins, and was was Coach Little sitting there. And they, they asked me, so I can go to the combine. And I said, well, what is the combine? And they said, well, that's where the top 336 college players go. I go, oh, I'm considered in that. Uh, and they said, yeah. I said, well, 
my old man ain't gonna pay for it. So I don't know how I'm gonna get there. So, I, I mean, I, no, I can't go. He says, no, no, no. Your Redskins are the closest to your university. We're responsible for all the guys that are in our area to, to get them there. I said, you're gonna fly me to, matter of fact, where are we going? Mesa, Arizona is where it was. So um, the Redskins sent me, sent me a nice care package with a luggage bag and hats and shirts. And my old man liked the Redskins, so he got all that gear and he couldn't believe it. My old man was never a guy who followed me playing football. He just, he just wasn't, now, he never watched me play. So, and that was just that. Um, but I got, I got I got a chance to go to, to Arizona and the agent, I had, had gotten an agent from uh, an old timer at Elizabeth City who put me in contact with somebody. And um, they had Ron Brown. Ron Brown was Olympic uh, track guy. Ron Brown went to Arizona State, Mesa, Arizona State, all kind of coordinates with each other. And he was out there and he was gonna work with me at the 40. I get out to, to Mesa, Arizona, I fly out there by myself. I've been flying planes before because my, my uncles lived in New York. so. I was familiar with flying, I wasn't that nervous. I got to Arizona, I got off the plane, they picked me up. Um, and then I saw Don Shula. Um, you know, I saw Chuck Noll. I saw Al Davis. These are people that I've only seen on TV. This is, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, the Ohio State or Notre Dame or UCLA. I don't, you know, these are things that are frequented by a guy that went to school. There's only 1200 students in my university. Um, and then I said, man, this is pretty cool. You know, I'm so I'm starstruck by this. And then I started to see guys that I used to watch a little bit on college ball, but usually college, we play at one o'clock. I'm out hanging out and partying, chasing girls on, on Saturday nights. I never watch other guys play college ball. Who cares? I would only concern with myself, but I knew this was serious. So I remember Vance Johnson played with Denver, mm -hmm. Randall Cunningham. Um, there was a couple other guys, but those are the two that I really remember. I know Bruce Smith and Al Toon didn't go to the combine that year, but I, I, you know, and, 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 and I ran a 40, I ran the drills. I did everything. And they said, I rated pretty high. Uh, when I got done with that, my agent called and said, Hey, um, from my understanding, you're going to get drafted um, between the third and the seventh round in the NFL. Well, before that was a USFL draft. I got drafted in the fourth round in the USFL to the Oakland invaders. So I like, Whoa, this is pretty cool. So they flew me out. I met that team. I decided to hold off. And it wasn't the same year that the USFL went defunct. So, you know, I, it wasn't going to be a team for me to play for. I probably could have signed and got a signing bonus, but uh, <laughs> I wasn't that bright at the time. So we just waited on the NFL uh, draft. And Dom Manili, uh, God rest his soul, he passed away a year or so ago, uh, who was always cool with me, who was a guy that came to Elizabeth City three or four times to watch me, was a guy who called me and told me I'd be coming to Cleveland. Uh, and it was so cool to see him when he would be out scouting when I finally got it, he always came to my locker. He always stopped and said, there's my guy, there's my guy. Cause I'm the guy he found that was doing good in Cleveland. Uh, and it, I guess it made him feel proud in it. And he always, he always seemed like an older uncle. He was like the uncle that stopped by to check on me every time he was in Cleveland. Pretty cool. That's real cool. And, and Reggie, at that point, when you got drafted, seventh round, 1985 by the Cleveland Browns, what did you know about the organization? What did you know about the history and the dog pound and everything else? Nothing. There was no dog pound. I am part of the dog pound. <laughs> the dog <laughs> pound got here with me, Hamper Dix and Frank Minifield, Clay Matthews, you know, Danny Fike. I mean, that came in 1985 when I was a rookie. That's when that started. That was the first uh, year. Okay. Yeah. That, that we were the beginning of the dog pound. I didn't, I didn't know anything about Cleveland football because it wasn't um, nationally televised um, in Virginia. We saw Philly, Washington, Pittsburgh, Dallas, um, and that was pretty much maybe Miami where the games that we got to see in our local states, you got to remember, I'm, I'm in an era, I'm going to be 58 next month. So I come from an era where you had, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS. There, there was no ESPN in my neighborhood. <laughs> I'm from the country. I don't even know if there was cable then. And if it was, it was a box on top of the TV where you would hit the buttons and switch from A, B, and C. Uh, that's when cable first came out when I was in college. But, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know much about Cleveland. Uh, when I got here, uh, the first thing they, they put me on a, 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 and they got me to the Harley Hotel in Berea, which is no longer there. Um, and then we went down to the facility. I got to meet people. The first person that I walked into, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I walked in, um, in the Berea and no one was there yet. I, maybe my flight was early or something. The only guy that was in there was Big Daddy Carl Hurston. Oh, yeah. Big Daddy Carl Hurston has always looked like an old guy. You know, uh, 
mature guy. I don't want to say he's an old guy, but when I got when I walked in there and he was naked, he's just gotten out of the shower and he looked like my old man. So I'm like, man, this is it. <laughs> is, that, is that a coach? <laughs> oh, that's but awesome. it was it was Big Daddy, and uh, and he's a Virginia boy. He's from Martinsville, Virginia. Went to Maryland Eastern Shore, so we had a lot in common. He actually played on the Philadelphia team where Johnny Walton was a quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Boston Breakers. Johnny Walton was my offensive coordinator at Elizabeth City. So oh. there was some ties there. So Big Daddy took me on his wing. And that was my that was my first day getting to Cleveland. That's the first guy I met. Uh, that's a great story. And did, when is the first time you met Jim Brown? Ooh, Jim didn't come around much uh, in my earlier years. I think there was a, still a funk between the, uh, the ownership and Jim. Um, I remember actually the only time I met Jim when I was playing was when Bill Belichick brought him in. I think Bill was the reason that uh, Jim or, or started to come back around because I don't think Art and he had a relationship um, over what transpired back when Jim left the Browns uh, and went out to, to LA. Mm -hmm. um, Jim and I became friends, obviously, as uh, I was a retired player. Um, I played golf with him, uh, just the three of us, me and Kevin Mack. Uh, Jim's a good golfer. I mean, he's he's older now, but he shot a 78 when he was 78 at Hilliard Lakes. Lakes. He really? You know, wow. That's little Augusta over there. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Jim will not play unless you're gambling. You got to pull out some money. Say, <laughs> and he'll wait till he gets on the tee. So, all right, young fellas, we'll be playing for the day. So. But Jim has always, and, and now I get a chance to shake his hand and talk to him. I even got a couple of photos that I took with him when I was on the sideline uh, a couple of years ago. He's getting up in, in, in age, but still a sharp man. And, and I know more about the Browns organization. And I understand more about Jim Brown and what he and the group of men did back in the 50s and 60s to ensure opportunities for so many athletes of yes. all walks of life, not just uh, uh, of African-American athletes, but all athletes. It's just creating opportunities for us to be able to venture out and have free agency and have so many other uh, opportunities in life. I mean, the Browns organization, Reggie, obviously got a lot of flack the past 20 years because of, you know, just the ups and downs they had. But when you look back at when you were drafted, you know, the previous 30 years, they had been one of the elite franchises in all of sports, really, you know, and they won eight championships back in, you know, what, between 46 and 64 and Otto Graham, Jim Brown, Warfield, and you had legendary guys that played there. So, you know, going into that 85 season, you know, in really the mid eighties, you have Bernie, obviously a quarterback, you have Mack and Biner, you have Minifield Dixon, uh, so many Clay Matthews. I mean, Brian Brennan, go on, we can go on and on, Rupster Slaughter, Ozzy. Did you guys think that you had a chance to go to the Super Bowl, you know, or was it something that was talked about or was it just let's go play the next game? You know, how, how what was the mindset of the mid 80s Browns? Well, you know, in, in 85, we were all so young. Uh, Webster hadn't gotten here. Brennan was in his second year. Ernest was in his second year. Bernie, I and Kevin, Felix Wright, we were all in our first year. Um, and we ran the ball more than we threw the ball and we had success in one eight and eight went down to Miami and uh, we were beat Miami 21 to three in, at halftime and then Marino, you know, got things going for Miami and they beat us. But what it, it, it did for us is we established a run game. We needed to get more diverse in uh, our passing game. Um, and it gave us an opportunity that Lindy and Fonte came in uh, in 1986. That was a big move. Uh, Lindy and Fonte took over the realm as offensive coordinator and Lindy gave us a whole new look on offense. He allowed, because I wouldn't have been able to be a good receiver in the first offense that Joe Pentry ran. And Joe was a good man, but, but, but that offense wasn't good for anybody who played wide receiver. We didn't throw the ball well. Lenny's offense exploited secondaries, exploited and took advantage. And Bernie being as sharp as he was, it gave us also insight to be able to, to predict what defenses would do. And Lindy and, and, and he had Gary Danielson that, that stayed in his ear. And you had uh, what Lindy was able to do with our group was, was spectacular. And I think that year, Webster was a rookie who became a starter. Uh, I became a full-time starter. Brennan and I always carried the plays in back and back. People never really realized that I only, and Brennan, we played half of the offensive plays, but we both played on third down because we carried the plays in and out. Um, and that was a big year for us. We won 12 games that year. Uh, we lost to Denver in the drive uh, year, but we were, we started to win and beat teams and, and not bat an eye at it. Like we had gained so much confidence as, as a bunch of young guys that we weren't concerned with the names on the helmet. 
um, we were playing the men on the inside and we thought we were better than them. And we came prepared to do that. And we beat Pittsburgh in that, uh, and, and it, there were the, the jinx game, I think 17 years that it hadn't been done. Uh, and, and that was pretty much some of the, the writing on the wall that we were a team to be reckoned with for years to come because we had a quarterback that was only 22 years old. And, and, and Marty Schottenheimer coming in, what a, impact did he have on the team? And, and rest in peace, Marty. I know he recently passed away, yeah. obviously a yeah. legend. Um, what impact did he have on the team? And that, that 86 season, you won 12 and four. You know, I know you had a couple OT wins. It was an exciting season. And I was a little kid then. But I, growing up, that was one of the season that kind of launched you guys. So Marty's impact on the team. And then what was the regular season like as far as going into the playoffs? What was the mindset like? Well, Marty, Marty was a teacher. Um, and I've heard Kevin say it, and I've heard a lot of the guys talk about it when, when, when Marty passed, but about three, four years ago, we had our 30th reunion for the, for the 86 team. And Marty came in, um, and we knew that he was, he was ill at the time and his wife was with him. Um, and, and to, to be able to spend time with him was good for all of us. It's a blessing for all of us to get to see him before things got worse. But Marty was the, 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 the teacher coach. He was also uh, the guy that if he stopped you and put his hands on your shoulder pads, you listen. You didn't turn away. You felt, you felt obligated to coach to do the best you could because he believed in you. And he always made you feel like that. I mean, when he told me, when they told me I had made the team and the talk that he gave me to prior to that, the talks that he gave me to, when he asked me if I was prepared to become a starter in the second game of 86, Little things that he did, you always felt like you could go to him in a sincere way and he would listen and give you the best advice. But Marty was, uh, he was a great guy for us at that time. He kept, he kept us close. He kept the whole idea of team first and we, and what we could do as a group, if we stuck together. Uh, the media was not as important as what we were doing. Uh, we kept everything in house and, and we had a good time playing football and that whole year, um, I mean, we just rode the wave. We rode the wave and we took shots down the field and we ran the football and guys would get injured and somebody else would come right in and play well. Um, and then, you know, that's just the way we were. In 80, in 85, we made applause. We went down to Vero Beach, Dodger Town, and stayed in, uh, in Florida for the game against Miami. So in 86, um, before we played Denver, we went back down there, which was nice. It was a getaway. It was just us. There was no one but the team and coaches and there were some guys from the press. We shot pool together. We hung out, um, hit a local place. We would go and have a few beers in, in the evening. But it was like training camp away from everybody else. And it was in 75, 80 degree weather. And then we get back on a plane and we fly back home and play in the cold weather. So little things like that made us closer. Um, we really liked each other as a group of men. There were very few guys that um, I didn't care for if there was any on our team. And I think that's the, the way it is for us now. Um, when Marty died, I got texts from guys and phone calls from guys. When a lot of our friends have passed away, Tony Jones died um, a couple of months ago before, before Marty. And Bone Jones was a staple on the offensive line and a very mm -hmm. good teammate. Um, and you just, you, you, guys liked each other, you know, and, and that's kind of a big deal. We cracked jokes. We hung out together. Um, every Thursday night, we were in TGI Fridays in North Umstead. And I mean, when I say we were out together, there'd be 35 guys there. Wow. Yeah. 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 We've, uh, we, we did some damage. You know, you, you mentioned Tony Jones. It's funny, Reg. So my old neighbor back when I was like six, seven years old, knew Tony, he was good friends with Tony. And my brother was a very good high school basketball player back in those days, yep. early nineties. And he actually invited Tony over to play against my brother. And he did, he played him one-on-one -on -one in basketball and I'll never forget it. I walked outside and this guy was, I mean, Tony was a mammoth. Huge. I walked out and I'm like, wow, my brother was pretty, you know, fairly big. He wasn't big, huge, but he was six, five. And Tony right. just made him look like, like nothing. And I'll never forget that game. He signed an autograph for me. I still have it. And to this day, I'll never forget that. I was very sad to hear he passed. Yeah, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of the thing of, of our group. Um, you won't see many of guys from my era not sign autographs. Uh, I, I remember even Bernie being the, the, the guy he was, how he stayed after and signed autographs with people. People would come up to us and at uh, TGF Fridays and we'd sign autographs for guys. And, um, you know, that was uh, Dino Lucarelli, um, Art Modell. I, I always will talk about Art because how well he treated us. And there's a lot to with the city and people don't care for the way things were handled and neither do I. 
But as far as art, art was big with us getting in, in, in the communities. He was big with us being humble and being a part of what took place with so many different foundations and, and hospitals and schools. Or every Tuesday, it was a big deal for um, Dino Lucarelli. He had a request order every day. Every Tuesday, we, were, we did something in the community. Um, there was no uh, valet parking before games. We walked from the parking lot to uh, gate A. There was all that interaction. And I think that's why people stayed so much in love with us. I mean, it, it does help that those guys didn't win for 20 years, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that, um, that we were so close to the city. I mean, you could see us in, in a nightclub. You could see us, you know, in church somewhere. You could see us in a lot of places that today maybe you don't see as many players because, you know, when they do something in the community, there's always a camera. And sometimes you can think, oh, they're just doing it for the camera. And the organization's got it all set up and pre-op. Um, we did that uh, every Tuesday. I mean, we were somewhere doing something for some community uh, outfit in this this city. Uh, Gino Lucarelli uh, speaks volume of what he did with that. But that is awesome. I didn't realize all that off the off the field stuff. I mean, when you look back at the 80s Browns, Reggie, and this time I'm a huge diehard Cleveland sports fan. I talk to fans all the time, all ages, you know, and obviously the LeBron Cavs of 16 will always have a special place in people's oh, yeah. hearts because they won the championship in LeBron and all that. But you look back, the 80s Browns and the 90s Indians are two teams that to me, will always have a special place in the hearts of Cleveland fans just because of what they they brought people together. Everyone remembers, you know, tons of players in those teams. And it was just, it kind of galvanized the, the city in many ways, both those teams. And growing up in the 80s, I was a little kid, but I remember, I mean, it was Browns everywhere. It's all people talked about was yeah. the Browns. And back then, the Cavs had a good team too with Price and Doherty oh, yeah. and Nance. I mean, so there was a lot of good teams back in those days and we went to the 90s Indians. So those are teams to me that my generation and my brother's generation will always remember for the rest yeah. of our lives. And of course, my dad's generation was the one going to the games back then. So I can remember so many Sundays where my dad would come home either very happy or very mad. I mean, I remember it vividly. So, I know your dad, when he's pissed, he's pissed. Oh, he's, <laughs> <laughs> right. so he's got an Italian so temper. Right. He, he on his face. Oh, yeah. And then he, he lived and died. He still does with the Browns. I mean, that, that was his he team. And he is a diehard, diehard Browns fan. So take us back to the 86 game against the Jets. One of the most storied games, you know, of that era. And my dad always talks about it. He was there, obviously. And you actually yeah. made a big catch in, in overtime. Um, and then Mark Mosley missed the field goal to win the game. And then, yeah. of course, he ended up hitting it after that. I could have been the hero of you that You could have been the hero. <laughs> I was on the six-yard line. Reggie, I just and watched that highlight a couple days ago. And I, I was like, oh, my, yeah. Reggie had that big catch. So take us back. When you guys were down 10, what was the feeling like, you know, not in the, just in the stadium, but with, with the team in general? So I, I've been asked this question before, so I, I already know exactly what I'm going to say. Um, so we were ready. You know, I mean, we, we were ready. We had won 12 games. The Jets, we didn't even think twice about it, except you, you still got to play the game. You still have to play the game. And, and nothing we did seemed to go right on offense. Defense was scrapping, hanging in there, scrapping, doing all they could. We gave them no hope on offense. I mean, we just were not able to get anything done. I don't know if Bernie hit a pick or two, or we just couldn't run the ball. It just, it, we were off. We were slow. We were behind the ball. Um, and then we got three minutes, four minutes to go in the fourth quarter. And we come back out for the last hurrah. We're down by 10 points. Um, and, you know, the fans are leaving. You know, I don't know how many, but the doors were open. And it, they were leaving the church at the time too soon. Uh, and BK comes in the huddle and says, hey, we're going to win this game. And, I, you know, I'm being a pretty normal guy, I go, Man, we ain't done nothing all day. I know where this is going to come from. And we went first incomplete, second incomplete, third down. Um, Gaston hits him in the back. And Gaston hits him in the back. He spits up a little blood. He's got that crooked body walk language. And he's pissed off that, you know, we get the penalty. The crowd's, you know, booing and all this stuff. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you ever hear that music in Rocky? You know, in, in your head, that oh, music yeah. rocky real low, and it, it, it elevates. And then, uh, you know, Ozzy caught a pass. Webster caught a pass. I caught a pass. Herman caught a pass. K-Mac got out of Brennan. Brennan, Ozzy, okay, touchdown. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We, we, we only down by three with, I don't know, two minutes ago or so. Um, defense, one, two, three, bang, done. We back on the field. Webster, Ozzy, me, Brennan, field goal. Holy crap. They done let us back in this game. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that was a play for us. And that was uh, that was probably one of the the I guess you can't say it ain't so. You you know you get you, you got to believe. I never doubted Bernie Kosar ever again after that. Well, Reggie, funny story. My dad, one of his best friends, let, they were sitting next to each other, and he left. He got so mad that this friend left. And to this day, they still rag on him. They oh, they give him a hard. You should see the stuff they say to him. It's the uh, but he, he had to he had to watch it in the parking garage, and he was so right. oh, he was so angry. So, in overtime, when you caught that pass and then Mark Mosley misses the field goal, how deflating was that at the time? I thought that was it. I, I, my emotions were ready for it to be it, except it's not it. We, we've got to do it again. Um, and, and, you know, and we obviously come out with the win, but the fact that I had caught that ball in there, I said, there's no way this isn't it. Because I, I, if I'm not mistaken, that was the first overtime and that was our first drive. We were down there early. This game should have been done within the first six, seven minutes of the first overtime. But then we ended up going to it again. So um, it's deflating. But after we had come back from where we were, I don't think anything was going to drop us off our emotional roller coaster to win this football game. We may have fallen off the fact that we missed a field goal. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But we didn't have time. You got to remember, there is no tomorrow. Mm-hmm. There is no tomorrow. There is no opportunity to say, all right, we lose one. We'll get them next week. No, we go home. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had come this far. And, and the idea of us being where we were, uh, it worked out for us. It, it, and and we, we got a phone call in the locker room. <laughs> I don't know who called. But they called. And the guy says, whatever you guys want is free down in the flats at Tangerine Farley's. <laughs> And the beach club had us roped off, man. We had a ball in the in the flats that night. Oh, I bet. Yeah, yeah we had oh, a ball. I bet. They were rocking down there, man. It was unreal. You know, it was it was it was it was Browns football at its best of excitement of winning a playoff game and feeling like 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 the city deserves to feel. Uh, it's not comparable to the championship game, but about as good as we're gonna get. Yep, agree. And you know, going into that Denver game. Did you, I mean, obviously I know you get this question a million times about the drive, but what was the feeling like going into that game and take us through that game? What were the ups and downs? And I mean, that was just, uh, obviously it's one of the most storied games in NFL history, but take us back to that day and the moment of, you know, when you guys were up and then of course Elway, or, you know, it's 2013, Elway comes down and, and uh, you know, they score that touchdown. I, I always thought we were better than Denver. If you go back and look at the turnovers, uh, of what we did to ourselves in both games. Um, they'll rank pretty high interceptions, fumbles, uh, miscues. Uh, we never played our best football against Denver, but yet we were in both games and they got blown out by teams that we had beaten in the Super Bowl. Um, John Elway was, is a special player, but we were a better football team. They played better that day. Uh, there is no way we should have allowed them to drive the ball 98 yards in two minutes and some change, but they did. Um, and, and you know, third and 18, and they completed. That's huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did things to us that we did to the de- Jets the week before. Um, and, and it was a sad day. And that one hurt me uh, more than the, the one out in Denver the following year. That one was a big one for me because we were home. We had just did the overtime uh, game against the Jets. We were where we needed to be to be a championship team heading to the Super Bowl. Uh, and they took the air out of us. Reggie, do you blame that drive on the prevent defense or do you think it was just Elway being Elway or, or a mix of both? Or how do you? I don't blame it on nobody. I'm an old man now. Um, <laughs> they played good football. We were in the wrong positions at the wrong time. Maybe the wrong defense call. Maybe a guy could have got a sack and barely didn't get it. Maybe a hand wasn't up fast enough. Um, we play the game because it's a game mm-hmm. and the results are what they are. Uh, I think the the fact that uh, I know that every guy on that team gave what he had and we fell short. Um, I, I, I don't put it on the prevent defense because it had been so successful for us to win at this time now 13 games that year. So whatever defense we had played all year uh, had gotten us there. So I'm sure that what they felt, the full press rush, drop off in zone, keep everything in front, except uh, they were playing against a guy who's a Hall of Fame quarterback. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that was really the beginning that launched Elway to what he became later on, you know, of course, winning the two Super Bowls and everything else. But the fumble game as well, you know, that had to be just as deflating, of course. But you said just because it was in Denver, it was a little bit different. It wasn't the home crowd in front of you. So it's, you know, it, it's a little bit different feel. But did you think you're also the better team that, that, that day as well? Absolutely. I think we, we, we turned the ball over again that day. And, and they were beating us 
21 to three at half. You know, th- that song that, uh, da, 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 hey, da, da, yep. da, da. well, I had never heard it before. And maybe I, I missed the, the, the memo or something. But <laughs> Denver's old mile high is aluminum bleachers. And they were beating us. And they were stomping on those aluminum bleachers a mile high. And it was echoing. And it was the loudest thing I could hear. And you know, you're getting your butts whipped. It's not even halftime. You can't get anything going. And they just kept playing it over and over and over. We, we go in the locker room. And uh, I don't think anyone said anything. You know, Marty always says something. Uh, you know, he, he, at, at times like that, Marty would say, just look around, man. Look at the guy next to you. You know, look at the look on his face. We're better than this. You know, I don't have to say nothing. Let's go get it done. That's the kind of thing Marty would say. I don't need to scream and yell. You guys have been here. You understand where you are. Now let's go play football. Uh, I score when we come out uh, of the tunnel. We get the ball. I, we go down and score. I catch a touchdown. And then they come right back. And Mark Jackson, I think, runs some crazy missed tackle touchdown for 60 or 70 yards. And we're right back where we were. And Ernest Biner came into play. And Ernest played his butt off. And we did a lot of good things in that second half. We went two-minute drill for two quarters. Let me tell you, in mile high, with that thin that thin air and that altitude, it's tough. It's tough to run full gear and play catch-up in Denver. But we did. Uh, and we got close to where we were. And then, uh, obviously, the the uh, you know the play that occurred that that people still talk about and uh, but we wouldn't have been there without Ernest. I mean, I, I felt bad for Ernest. I still do. You know, I'm glad he got that Super Bowl with Washington. You know, years oh, yeah. later with Mark Rippon and those guys because I, I thought he deserved that. And it kind of just his legacy. I mean, I know they'll always talk about the fumble, but to me, he was such a great player, and that's that shouldn't define his legacy at all. And it doesn't. But a lot of people talk about that, so I'm glad to see he he got a ring and you know and kind of uh, you know hopefully that's what people look at him more so as, yeah. but. He, he's a uh, he's he's a great man, and he's he's a good father and a husband and, and a grandfather. He's a uh, he's a good friend to me. He, um, you know, for years we never talked about it, um, and, and I didn't let people talk about it. If I was golfing with a group of guys at a charity event, it's not a conversation that that I need to indulge in or discuss. And it's one of those things that we kind of always kept in house. It just never came up, and then maybe maybe five years ago, maybe even six years ago, um, met Metcalf, uh, K-Mac, uh, myself and EB, we always play in the uh, uh, alumni tournament together. And, um, and EB had written the book, you know, everybody fumbled. So it was the first time he had put it into words and the first time we've heard the words come out of his mouth. And he talked during that day of golf about his journey about what he went through, things we didn't know. Because, you know, I, I don't know if I never had the balls to ask him, hey, man, are you okay? You know, I, it's a football game. We keep moving forward. But I didn't know he was getting all the heat that he was getting. He kept that in-house. Um, so to watch him, the transformation of what happened then, how he went to Washington, the, the dark days that he endured alone, uh, and to see him come out on the other side and become a, a, a sharper guy, uh, you know, the, I, I think through adversity, you know, when we come out on the back end of it, it's just our journey. It's just our journey. And uh, he's got a lot of experience to share with a lot of people, a lot of young men. Uh, I think he's, he was a coach for a while with Baltimore. T- uh, I think he was at Tennessee for a while. Uh, and I don't, wouldn't be uh, surprised to see him back in coaching or in some way involved with young people because the things that come out of his mouth are very elevating for young people. Uh, it's still elevating for me. They're, 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 he, he's a sharp guy. Yeah, I mean, he, he's a guy, great player. And it's, it's nice to hear the off the field stuff with, with Ernest and that he's doing, yeah. you know, I mean, I, most of the fans I talk to, almost every fan I talk to doesn't have anything bad to say about him. I mean, it oh, happened, no. it happened and people, I, I don't hear anybody really having any complaints, but you know, we went, we went through the shot with Craig Gilo, Michael Jordan, and Jose right. Mesa say, you know, so it is what it is. It happens in sports. That's part of the game. I mean, any game you yeah. play. So I, I, I don't think there's any animosity. I've never heard any animosity towards the Browns fans I talked to with Ernest. It's mostly just good memories with that whole era of guys. And I, I want to bring up Bernie, you know, for obvious reasons. He was, he was an icon back then in, in Cleveland, especially. And where do you put him, Reggie? You know, you had Jim Kelly, Marino, Elway, uh, Warren Moon. You had some great quarterbacks back then, some of the all-time greats. Where do you put Bernie in that discussion in that era? Well, 
Bernie's my quarterback. I mean, he did everything possibly that he could do to put us in winning situations in every game I ever played with him. Um, Warren Moon was a was a was a competitor against us. Um, we beat up on Houston majority of the time. He's got great numbers then in Houston. Um, Kelly, uh, you know, I've, I've always cheered for Buffalo because my boy Bruce played there. Uh, so I mean, these are guys that Bernie pretty much beat, just like uh, you know, <laughs> we beat those teams. Um, Bernie's a pretty pro, 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 pro. solid guy. You know, he was my quarterback. So when you're talking about ranking people, I try to get away from that. Um, is one guy better than another? I, I think situations declare whether a guy's better than another guy in situations. I thought Bernie was great in tough situations. He was smarter than any of them. He was aware better than all of them. Maybe not the most physical of all of them, but uh, he used what he had to get the job done. And if I had a choice to pick him, BK would be my guy. I mean, you're right. Bernie was never the most athletic or physical quarterback in the world, but he just was so what he could do with the football and the sidearm and everything else, the, the way he could read a defense. I remember back then as a little kid, you know, my dad would always talk about it and the people around me who watched football. And I started to realize how, you know, just how smart Bernie was and what he could do. So um, it's, it's interesting hearing your take on that, actually playing with him and, and you know, him he as a person too. When you sit in a meeting with, with Bernie and Lindy and Fonte and listen, you know, so you had those guys down in the front row. We were in Berea and, and there's a, it's a theater seating. Um, so the quarterbacks would be down front and, and they're always mumbling, you know, because they don't really want us to know everything. It's like the, the president of the company, he never tells all of his subordinates exactly what he's trying to do. And then you got the receivers up back and all we're trying to do is point out that I'm open, I'm open, I'm open. Um, but when they start explaining, not not what we're trying to accomplish, but what the defense is trying to do to us so we understand what we need to do to break what they're trying to do. So in other words, we need to be ahead of them. On third down, they do this. If there's, uh, you know, if this guy comes in the game, they play this coverage. So you can expect this, this guy, if you want a left hash, he's going to do this. If he takes one step forward, then we need to be ready for that. I mean, all these little things. And Bernie could sit there and look around, see all the personnel, and you would always hear Danny Fike and Cody and Mike Babb in the huddle declaring who's coming in because Bernie's back's to him, and he could watch him and see 54 is in the game, 54 is in the game. They're going to run this. They're going to run this. Okay, alert, alert. And then by the time we get to the line, we have one play. And then Bernie could do this and point to somebody, and then everything just changed. Everything just changed. Because this fool over here thinks he's got a he's gonna make a play. He's the sucker that's about to get played. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how we would do it. You know, everybody had to be on the same page. And you know, and, and it's cool that, you know, and that's why we laugh at some of the stuff. Danny Fike's a good friend of mine. Danny and I, we came in the league together too. And you should hear the old linemen talk about what they had going on. Cause you know, you got the receivers and we got our room. Then you got the running backs in their room. You got quarterbacks, you got the linemen. Everybody's got their own little thing going. But then when everybody starts to talk, you know, it's almost like, I see what you see. I understand what you're doing. Cause we were big with the run game. You know, there's nothing like being, you know, up by four, up by three with six minutes to go. And you got Byron and Mac pounding it down somebody's throat. And they hate that. They hate that. They want us to turn the ball over. They want us to, you know, stop the run. And we run the same play. K-Mac just pounds ahead for four. Four, four, and four is 12. That's the first down. Let's keep moving. <laughs> uh, Mac was a monster. No doubt oh, about yeah. it. And another guy I wanted to ask you about, Clay Matthews. You know, obviously yeah. his bid to get in the Hall of Fame. Where do you, you know, do you think he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? And what was he like as a teammate? Sweetness is what we called him. Uh, he should be in the Hall of Fame. No question. I, and I think the one thing that hurts him, um, his tenure and his tenacity and his play and his stats are all fine. But when you watch a game, you may not always see Clay being the Lawrence Taylor, but he's making his plays and doing what he's supposed to do. So if your name is not called 10 times during a the game, then you may not get that, that hype, as they say, uh, that some other people have deserved. And, and what Clay deserves to be in Hall of Fame. Uh, he played a long time doing it very good at a high level. Uh, and it's unfortunate um, that he's not in and didn't go in. Now he has to go in as a, as a what do they call it, old timer, or I know they, they got a term for it. Yeah. yeah Clay was a great teammate, man. Clay, Clay I'll tell you my, my funny Clay story is, so 
most of us were single uh, back in, in, in the early 80s. We were 22, 23 years old. So we may go out. It was always Sunday night and then Monday or Thursday night and then Friday. Or Clay had, his wife had a boy that was maybe five, which is probably probably Clay. And then, you know, he got all the sons that play ball. And then there was one, maybe three, there'd be one in her a, 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 a stroller, she'd be pregnant with one. His wife, there was always a lot of babies. There's four or five of them. And Clay's always would say, he go, Langy, Webb, what you guys do last night? He's living through us because he's at <laughs> home with five babies running around. Uh, he said, yeah, man, I need a story to keep me going. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. That was my, yeah, that, that would be every Monday and every uh, Friday morning. He wanted to know what is it like to be single again, you know. But Oh, that's yeah, funny. He was a good guy. He's a good friend, too. Yeah, it's a shame that he isn't in the Hall of Fame. I mean, look at his career, like you said, it's just Agreed. the longevity and what the impact he had on the team and, and just the, his toughness and everything else about him. He's a staple the, uh, linebacker in the National Football League for 17, 18 years. And to do what he's done, he should be in the Hall of Fame, no question. Completely agree. What, one of the things I want to talk to you about, too, is kind of interesting. You know, the, you look at, like, iconic images of Cleveland Browns history. You, know, you have Jim Brown, Otto Graham, of course, and there's certain things people always look back to. Bernie, you know, certain photos of Bernie. But one of them is you and Webster doing the high five. That's one right. photo you see everywhere in Brown's history. Did you, did you guys realize how iconic that would become in Brown's folklore? No, no. Um, so Michael Jordan had just won the dunk contest. And if you know anything about the, the year that Jordan just, the, the same one that he's got the, 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 the his logo, the Air Jordan logo. Yep. Um, he did a dunk from the side, from the baseline and uh, and we were just talking about the dunk contest. You know, maybe they were doing special teams or something. And all the receivers were over there jacking around. Uh, and then two guys did it. And then and then we started doing it together. And they said, you know what? We should do a high five like that. So we called it sky jamming. So Webb and I agreed. Whoever scores, the other guy meets him halfway. And that's when it began. I love uh, it. And I think Denver, we were playing Denver. I don't know. Uh, and some photographer took it from the bottom with us up, he's got the best shot. That's the original one. Um, and it looks like we're eight, nine feet off the ground. Uh, and it was a centerfold for Sports Illustrated back in 1990. Um, and then there was t-shirts and there's, you know, there's all kinds of photos and stuff. And when we signed uh, autographs together, <laughs> so I had K-Mac a little pissed off. K-Mac and I drove from, from uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from Cleveland to Columbus a couple of years ago for an autograph signing, and you know, K Max, you know, K Max, K Mac, Kevin Mack, and he signs a lot of stuff. And Ernest, they sign a lot of stuff. And normally they would sign more than any of us. Well, Webb and I were there at this one, and Brennan, and that photo sold more than anything. Wow. So I believe it. When we all got done, because they pay you per signature or some crazy way they pay you. Well, Webb and I had, we had more than any of them. <laughs> they like, came out like, hey, man, every now and then a squirrel finds nothing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, because, like, whenever I think of that era, Reggie, that's the first thing I think about is you and, and Webster yeah. doing the high five. It's just the yeah. first image that comes to my head. And a lot of people in my generation, that, that's interesting yeah. that that, you know, how that came about. I didn't know that was because of Jordan. It was that's pretty interesting. Jordan. I've, I've had yeah. a lot of former NBA players in this podcast, so that's pretty interesting that that came from that. So. That is called Sky Jamming. We never called it a high five in the air. People say that and I said, no, it's called sky jamming. And it all comes from Michael Jordan. That's very cool. And that was back when Dominique Wilkins, I mean, there were some I mean, incredible dunkers back in that era going against each other. But and those were to me the real dunk contest. Nothing as smooth as Jordan. No, I'm no, Jordan big was big a whole guy. different level. <laughs> yeah, he was a whole different level. Don't, yeah, don't get me started. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now I want to take Eric Metcalf is another guy I wanted to ask you about. When he oh, yeah. came onto the scene, what was your thoughts about him as a player and, and just the impact he had on the team with his speed and everything and his playmaking ability? So my wife's back here and my wife knows my relationship with, with uh, Emet. All right. So I'm just going to tell you a story about my guy. All right. So he comes to Cleveland from university of Texas, had a Mercedes in college. You know, he had a big screen TV, you know, his number one pig, blah, 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 blah. I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like him. He seemed arrogant. He had some nice, cool clothes on and gold necklace. Uh, they say he could run and jump and all this stuff. Uh, and I shied away from him. And then somehow one day we get to talking and we ended up kind of chit-chatting and, and, and just, I don't know, became friends. 
Um, he got hurt. He tore his shoulder, dislocated his shoulder. Uh, and he couldn't get dressed in the morning. So he stayed with me. He, he stayed at my house. I brought an Atari and we would play Atari at night and I'd get him dressed in the morning. And we became friends. Um, we became roommates on the road. And I knew we were different because I had gone out on the, the, to eat dinner the night before a game. I don't know. Let's say we were in, I don't know, Arizona somewhere. And uh, I go out with the guys. We always like go to Japanese steakhouses when we go somewhere. And Webb and I, that's what we did. We were going to find a Japanese. We find, well, you didn't Google back then. You had to look in yellow pages. I at, at, asked the concierge uh, at, the, at the hotel lobby. And I come in from dinner and Metcalf is sitting on the bed with a robe on, slippers, filing his nails, talking on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, it, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> he, he is bougie, big time bougie, <laughs> you know? But, but uh, we, stayed, we, we stayed friends. Um, I went up to Seattle for his grandfather's, his grandfather not born the same day. So he always liked me because he always says that you and my granddaddy got the same birthday and I played in a charity event up there with him. I went up there and hung out with him for his birthday parties and get togethers. And, and this is my last Metcalf story. So I know he's the way he is, boozy. You know, his dad played in the league. He's known a world that I never knew. So he's been around the pro athletes all the time. Um, so I get a phone call from him and he says, hey man, listen, what are you doing? And we went to cruises together. We always did a trip together after every season. Uh, we went to Brazil together, we took cruises together. And then I promised him when I retired, I would go to every city wherever he played. So I went to San Diego to watch him play. I went to Carolina to watch him play. I went to Atlanta to watch him play. So every year, every season, one of my one weekend, I would take off and come watch him play. He was my little brother. Uh, so I got a phone call and this has got to be 25 years ago. And I'm in Virginia uh, at home. And uh, he says, hey man, what are you doing? I say, I don't know, I'm just hanging out. And he says, what are you doing June 18th, you know, 19, whatever. I go, man, I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, he says, listen, uh, you, will you stand up with me? And I said, absolutely, my brother. I said, absolutely. He says, uh, uh, and I hadn't really met his wife, Lori. Uh, and then and he said, yeah, I met a nice lady. I've been with her for a few years and she's gonna be my wife. And I go, okay, cool, I, I like it, I like it. He says, I got this guy named Mike. I, I say, what? He says, I got this guy named Mike who's who's a tailor. No, he's so you're getting tailor made suits is what you're telling me. Bougie, I'm telling you. So he 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 says, Mike's gonna fly to Virginia. And then where's your restaurant? I had a bar at the time in Newport News, Virginia. I say it's in Newport News, here's the address. He said, Mike's gonna pick out a hotel, a hotel, a little hotel, and he's gonna be there. Can you come and do this? Can you do that? So I'm I, I don't know what all this means. So he, uh, this guy, Mike, calls me and says, yeah, I'm at the Connell Lodge. Can I meet you tomorrow at 2 o'clock? I go there to Connell Lodge. This guy's got a, a dummy, whatever you call him, mannequin there. Uh, and he, me he measures me. You know, he says, can you come back in, in three hours? So he, this guy has cut a suit, pinned a suit, um, and then had got my autograph. And I said, okay, how's this going to work? So Matt had 10 of us in his wedding, ball players from all over. I mean, guys I played against, you know, our teammates, all in his wedding. He brought us cream, almost white, bad suits <laughs> with burnt orange vests because of Texas. For UT, ah. but it was Texas. He paid for the shoes, the socks, the belt, the suit. The only thing I had on was my underwear and my watch. <laughs> he, I mean, <clears throat> and we all had an autograph. <clears throat> Our names on the inside. That's the way he was. Uh, we went to his wedding. It was in the top of Bill Gates building in Seattle. He had, you know, fancy food, crown bottle, crown roll on every table. I mean, this cat knows how to do it, brother. So Matt's my friend. I um, love it. We talk every week. He, he's my friend. He's, he's a heck of a ball player, you know, and, and, and I could see him playing and not really see how special he was. And then I watch highlights of what he does when people are around him, how he could avoid him on when he's got the ball in his hands is amazing. We were playing Cincinnati uh, there. I think he was a rookie. Uh, by this time we were friends or maybe his second year. And it's the one where he does a bunny hop. Mm -hmm. People have talked about that. Now, 
I'm not, this is, this is just a true story. So he makes that move and I'm on the field looking at it. And then he scores and he comes to the sideline and we're sitting beside each other. And uh, I said, man, they just showed that boy. That's a bad move, brother. He said, Shh. He said, man, I'm pissed off. I go, why? He says, look at this. And he points down at his sock. He says, they got me. They touched my sock. He wasn't supposed to touch me at all. <laughs> like, I said, man, I would have been down at the three. <laughs> that's but that's how he story. is, you know? I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh and we God. still laugh about that to this day. I remember, and you, I think you were in India at this point, but I remember 93 when he had those two touchdowns against Pittsburgh, those two punt returns. Right. I mean, that was just, I've never seen anything like that before. And the way he yeah. could just maneuver and get past people. And he was, he was incredible. He was electric. Him and Josh yeah. Cribbs are the two guys to me that I've seen in my career that are just absolutely electric every time they got the ball. You never knew absolutely. what they were going to do. Absolutely. Um, it's funny. One of my brother's best friend, his, actually his best friend lives out in Seattle and, and knows Eric and they met somewhere. I can't remember where they met, but uh, he still keeps in touch with them. So I've known about him for quite a while, but he, yeah, uh, yeah they Metcalf was a special talent. That's for sure. I mean, not many guys have that kind of ability to make plays like that. You know, his, vision, his vision's unreal. I mean, I, I got like, again, I, I, I've watched film and I've seen films and sometimes I just fiddle with stuff on YouTube and his vision is unreal and just how smooth he did it. I guess that would be the right word. He just how smooth he he didn't want you to touch him. Nevertheless, tackle him. No, he was you're right. He was silky smooth. That's a perfect way to describe watching him play. Right. And Reg, your last year in the league in '93, you actually had your best year then. I think you had 85 right. receptions, over a thousand yards. It was a heck of a year. Why? You know, why did you retire after that? You were 30 years old. Was it just you wanted to get away from the game, or was it injury problems, or what was the the issue? Well, I had a lot of problems around that time, and and nothing that probably couldn't have been dealt with, but I chose not to deal with them. Uh, my life outside of football became more important than the task at hand. Uh, I drifted away from the focus of, of, of participating in, in athletics and participating in the nightlife. Uh, it cost me years of my life uh, drifting away. Um, and I regret it, but as I've learned to deal with it and live with it. Um, I've made peace with it. Um, but that was, uh, that was a dark time for me. Uh, and you know, it, it's it's almost like you 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 think it's gonna last forever. And all the veterans always tell you that, you know, hang around as long as you can, get as much as you can, make sure it's ready when it's time. Or I pretty much walked myself out of it uh, before my time. And uh, I went through a, a, a horrible stage of, you know, I, I don't know, depression, frustration within myself. And, and I fueled it with, with, with alcohol. I fueled it with things that weren't, weren't gonna be beneficial to me. And it cost me you know, 20 years of my life of, of just being on a treadmill, treadmill to nowhere. Uh, it's a dark place, dark time. Um, been fortunate enough to run across some nice people, uh, some good guys, and uh, I got all that straightened out. So man above looked out for me as long as I was willing to do some work. Yes. Uh, haven't had a drink in a little while now. And, you know, that, that's a, a great story for people. A lot of people struggle, obviously, with all types of, whether it's addictions or mental health issues. I mean, I've had my struggles with things in the past. And, you know, you think at 25, 30 years old, you think you have the world figured out in some ways. And you have no idea, really, at that age. I mean, at 25, I thought I had everything planned. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I'm smarter than everybody else. I got to figure it figured out. You really have no idea what you're doing at that age, but you think you do. Zero. So, you know, I, I think your path is a path a lot of people have gone down. And it's, it's at this age, I'm sure, Red, you could teach a lot of the younger generation, you know, who are struggling you know, what, what they, where they could go to maybe, you know, escape some of that or, or get help. You, you, you know, you could, I could probably, and I do get involved with a lot of lives of, of people who want the help. The unfortunate thing is most of us don't because we don't want someone else guiding us. Uh, if you're in the darkness, um, I was there for a long time. I mean, my most loved ones, my now wife, my sister, my, my mom, my friends, you know, many of them have tried to talk me into um, doing something about my, my, my alcoholism. And uh, they was talking to deaf's ear uh, until I was ready. And the same thing, I, I can tell my story to young people. I can tell my story to old people because I can assure you, this is just not a young man's disease. Um, but until you're really, really willing and ready, um, you, you don't get too far. Somebody's gotta, gotta make that decision that they wanna change their lives. Um, I got some friends now that 
Um, I got a college fraternity brother that I, I worry about. I got a cousin that I've been worrying about for 20 years, but what can you do? I can lead by example. And maybe they, they hear something one day or, and they say, hey, uh, what is it that you're doing? What, what, what can I do for myself? But most of us that are, are caught up in addictive natures, uh, it's gotta run its course until you just say I've had enough. Exactly right. I mean, Reggie, I think it, like you said, people have to make that decision themselves. You can't force right. someone. You can, you can try to say go to rehab or whatever, but if they're not willing to really put the work in and really change, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're sitting in rehab or not. It's, it's, uh, and it's tough because you never know when someone's going to make that decision. But, you know, and I, I know the hope people- is the, the hope is, and, and when folks in rehab and some people get it and when they come out there, they're better off. Uh, some people don't, but the hope is that pause, you know, that week, that two weeks, that three weeks, the clarity that someone gets, you hope that they say, oh my goodness, what have I been doing? And that's the whole idea of being in a facility like that. And, and no one knows. You can hear the best therapist, the best guy talking, and that guy just doesn't get through. And then somebody says something and you go, aha. You know, I sound like uh, boys from uh, coming to America. Aha. Is <laughs> <laughs> the second one come out? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. But that's, and that's what happened to me. You know, I, I sat with some people um, and I got a little pause. Uh, and and uh, and and somebody told me to pray, and I had never asked God for anything when I was like that, and and I did. And by being as honest as I could be, when the obsession to drink was lifted, that was my corridor to make a lot of decisions. And and I, I won't say it's been easy, but at least that part's been easy. Now I just got to figure out how to continue it, how to maintain it, how to stay stay sober and and live a better life. And I know my wife now is very grateful because I probably wouldn't have a wife if I hadn't changed my life. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know that's probably something not easy to talk about, but you know, I, I understand my journey. (laughs) Well, I mean, Reggie, a lot of people are going to, I mean, people who watch this who are going through that or or, or suffering through addiction will relate to that. And I think a lot of people look up to you obviously as a, not only a former Browns hero here, but a professional athlete in general. So um, that's something that a lot of people can, you know, turn to for just having solid advice from people who've been through it. I mean, I don't care what you hear, unless someone's been through it, it's hard to really take someone seriously. You know, if you've yeah. been through it, they'll, they'll listen to you. Say, I've, been, I've been through the darkness. Um, a couple other questions I want to get to before, you know, I, I appreciate your time today, Reggie. This has been awesome. Oh, oh it's so, cool. When we... Your dad will probably come and see me tomorrow, you know that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I know, you know he will. And they'll say, hey, you have <laughs> my son's podcast. Listen. Yeah. <laughs> That's all he'll talk about the next three times he sees you. Right. So, <laughs> That's okay with me. So... Toughest cornerback you ever had to face in the NFL? So there was Mike Haynes, played with New England, played with the Raiders. Mm -hmm. There was Albert Lewis. Albert Lewis played with KC. It was, no, Albert Ross, Kevin Lewis. Kevin Ross, Albert Lewis. Uh, They played with KC. They were pretty good and tough. But I I had two guys that... uh, taught me a lot about the game by just working hard every day. And that was Hanford Dixon and Frank Minifield. Uh, you go against them every day. And back then, bump and run was a deal. If you didn't get off the line of scrimmage, you don't catch passes. And you better fight and claw and learn how to get off the line of scrimmage. We had no issues with anyone jamming us at the line of scrimmage because of what we did in practice. Because we got serious uh, against our, our, our secondary. Because you got to remember, Hanford calls himself top dog and you got Minnie and you got, you know, Felix and Al Gross and Chris Rockins and all those guys, you know, so they got cocky in practice. Well, I'm a big country boy. You got Brennan, the Irishman from Detroit, <laughs> and you got Slaughter, who's from Stockton, California with his Jerry Curl. We ain't gonna let nobody just bully <laughs> us around. So we got very intense and very competitive. And that was another thing that, that Marty instilled in us. He's a cream rises to the top. If you guys press each other in practice, um, you guys will get better as a team. And that's what we did. You know, I, and, and I, since I'm talking about that real quick, this was a, 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 probably one of those compliment things that I don't even think about sometimes. So we would play uh, Haywood Jeffries mm-hmm. from Houston. Houston. Yep. We would play Al Toon mm-hmm. from, uh, from the Jets. And they were tall and lanky. So Frank Minifield would come to me uh, Monday, 
No, we have Monday and it would be the week getting ready. He said, hey, I might need to look for me this week. Might need to look for me this week. And then Tuesday we have off and Wednesday, he come to me again and he said, hey man, uh, if you don't mind, give me a good look. I need a good look. So that means I'm tall and lanky and what Frank needed was a tall receiver to press him all week so that when he got in the game against those taller receivers, it wouldn't be as hard for him, but he he didn't need the little receiver. He wouldn't even want Gerald or Clarence Weathers to go against him or Brendan because they were short guys. So it, the thing is, when 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 I get done with my offense, I'm a starter. I don't want to run look team. And I'm done, you know. But I would run look team for Frank. You know, I would get out there and go at him hard. We would go, let's say, 12, 15 plays a game, a, a, a practice, whether it be seven on seven or whether it be in team. But he would say, okay, let's work. And we dap up and we will work. I'm helping him get ready for the big receiver. And then uh, game over, he plays great. And he'll be the first guy to come up to me and say, hey, bro, thanks for the look this week. You know, that was the thing that 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 made us what we were. You know, he I, I took the time to do the work. He asked for the work. We both had success during the game. We won the game. And he was appreciative of the extra work I gave him. So that's 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 just Marty, Marty's uh, boys. That's how we were. That's the way he taught us to do. That's the kind of men we were. And that's the way we respected each other as teammates. Yeah, team first culture. Absolutely. That's, that's great. Absolutely. What was the toughest hit you ever took on the field? Because you were known for going over the middle. And my dad always says, Reggie was one of the few guys that would actually go over in the middle and take those hits. What was the toughest hit you remember taking? And who There's was two. There's two. Uh, one was Sam Mills, God rest his soul. He broke four of my ribs in New Orleans in 1989, maybe. Oh. 80, I don't even know when it was. That's how long, that's how bad it hurt. I don't even remember what year it was in. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, yeah, he broke four ribs. Um, and then Bubba McDowell with Houston caught me center mass. Bernie threw one up. Uh, my mom gave Bernie a nasty look leaving the stadium that day. <laughs> he told me Monday, he said, man, I, I, I wanted to come over there, but your mama was looking at me. <laughs> Yeah, he, he gave me one center mass and, and, and I doubled over. My feet kicked him in the groin. My face mask hit him in the back. And then I flopped over, hit my head coming down. So, uh, yeah, that was that, that was that wasn't good. Oh. That wasn't good. But those were probably the two rough. The, the ribs, I was out for a month with the ribs. I was in the hospital for probably nine, 10 days. Wow. I had bruised up some other stuff in there. And you talked about Bubba McDowell. They had Chris Dishman. And I mean, they had, uh, that was a house oh, yeah. of pain back then. Yep, that was, yeah, they uh, had the, they had those guys. And before that, they had Steve Brown and, uh, God, what's Metcalf's boy? I can't think of his name. He was in his wedding too. I, I think of it when we get off. But yeah, they, they had some uh, some good ball players in, in that secondary. Oh, yes, they did. And when you look back at the receivers in NFL history, give me one or two that you think are the most underrated. You know, guys that people don't talk about. You know, we all hear about Jerry Rice and, and all the other, you know, Rand, Randy Moss, et cetera. Give me one or two you think these guys are fantastic, but they never really get a lot of press. Wow. That would be, man, that would be a hard question to go back. And I would have to see names to or even guys you played against, who you admired, who you thought this guy's a heck of a receiver. Webster Slaughter. <laughs> no, wanna... I, I, I don't, I, I see that I'm drawing blanks. Uh, and maybe that's just my old age of trying to go back and put, put faces. I love watching Chris Carter catch the rock, but he's a hall of famer. What about uh, guys like Art Monk or, or those kind of guys? You oh know? yeah. Well, I cheered for Art Monk, you know, Cliff Branch and those guys uh, yep. back when I was a little kid. Um, I watched uh, Steve Largent run our, mm -hmm. uh, a dig post route which we call a seven route on Hanford Dixon. And I don't know if I've ever seen a route ran so, so pretty. Um, he hit him twice on the same inside move and Hanford knew the second time he was gone and then he peeled back out of it. Hanford was down by the center and he was 30 yards upfield. So um, yeah, there, I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't come up with, with names right now off the top of my head. You know, Lewis Lips had a nice football game. Um, back in the day, I, I used to enjoy watching them play. I tell you now, now you're bringing me back the, the Duper boys, the Marx brothers down yep. in Miami. They oh, yeah. Yeah, they used to get busy. Um, I yeah, forgot Andre about them. Reed was always a solid player. Yep. I'm a big fan of Andre and a friend of his because all those Buffalo guys uh, used to always come to Virginia with Bruce. So Andre and I got to be pretty good friends. Yeah, there were so many great receivers back then. I forgot about yeah. Duper and those guys on Miami. Completely oh, yeah. forgot about that whole crew. They, they were loaded. And Frank and Frank and Hanford locked them up. 
Wow. They locked them up. When we played against Miami, they had those boys locked up. They didn't like being bumped and run all day. You know, they <laughs> wanted free release off the ball and then they could do what they want up top. And I, I try to get young players to, to, to think of that now. If you beat a guy at the line of scrimmage, you won't have to deal with him up the field. But if you let him ride you at the line of scrimmage, then you got to deal with him a second time. And then, you know, so many young receivers now, you always see them on the sidelines, one or two yards from the sidelines. You got no room to maneuver. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of getting around a guy and then pressing inside, then having five or six yards. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, sometimes I wonder, I said, what do they teach these guys? They just let their raw talent jump up and catch the ball. Well, you got one yard over there to catch that. Well, I mean, that's, that's horrible coaching to me. Horrible. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to real quick, the, the current Browns, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I know you cover the team and, and you, you know, obviously there's a lot of excitement around them right now. Kevin Stefanski, Andrew Barry, it completely changed the culture and really, you know, two young guys now going forward who hopefully are going to be here for many years. Where do you see this team going in the next, you know, three to five years and with Chubb, Baker, Miles, I mean, Landry, they got a lot of talent now. And how close do you think they are to being a legit Super Bowl contender? Or do you think they're already there? Well, I, I, I think this organization would, would have been fine if Al Lerner hadn't have passed away. And I think passing the torch to his son um, was a horrible situation for the city. I won't say the organization, just the city, because they got dealt, had to deal with all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the transition of all the names coming in here. Every year was someone new, some new guy in the press would always write, this guy's got his stats and this and that. Um, and then the question of whether or not this year wasn't Stefanski was the guy. Uh, I don't know Kevin Stefanski. And I probably was the guy to go, well, I don't know. I have to wait till I see it because I'm tired of reading what you guys tell me. Or I, I, A man's character, when he can get what he got out of those guys this year, um, the penalties went down. The conduct off the field, even though it was COVID, so nobody was out, but the conduct off the field was down. The run game, beauty, um, Baker, you know, just playing solid football because the run games helps him out. And a defense that was decimated that seemed to at least play tough when necessary. Uh, that's coaching. That's, you know, getting people that can, uh, Barry's job is to get people back in and get stronger and more depth. Uh, they work well together. Um, and then I always say this. Now they know what you got. Now they know what you got. Year two is the test. You know, in 85, we did the same thing. We made the playoffs. But year two, year three, they know what you got. There's no lacks on Cleveland no more. The good teams will come harder and the weaker teams will come harder. Um, how you react after last year will tell me a lot about what this team is really capable of. If they can win 10, 11 games, 12 games this year and make back to the playoffs, then what they've done has been successful. Baker comes out and lights it up again. They keep the team intact. Um, I don't see no reason at all why this team can't have a five, six, seven year run uh, and, and sustain it for a long haul. Uh, being a playoff Super Bowl, all that stuff is within reach. I don't talk Super Bowl because it's always, to me, one game at a time. I'm just, that's just the way I was built. Um, you know, until you play 16 games, there's, there won't be a 17th game. Uh, and we'll worry about that when we get there. But if we do what we're supposed to do, we'll be there in the end. And, and I think these, this group, I, I do like the way Stefanski has uh, made young men uh, think more of themselves. Um, they're not a losing bunch of men. I mean, even when they were losing, you might've had some guys that thought they could do better and they weren't doing better. But, you know, all we saw was mouth, you know, new guys come in from different teams, old guys with the same garbage, you know? And finally they got a lot of character guys and, and you know, uh, Miles Garrett's a character guy. You've got uh, you got Chubb, who simply does it by what he does, not what he says. And if you get 20 guys following Chubb's actions, then you're going to be okay because it's, it's, it is attraction. And guys want to be like the stars are going to be. And you got a lot of stars that aren't talking, just playing. Then you'll get a team that does a lot of playing and not talking. And I think another guy, Jarvis Landry, when he first came here, oh, I felt he kind of instilled this. He's my favorite. He's just he's my favorite. Hands down. He's my favorite player. He we dap up before every game. I'm on the field as a uniform inspector. And he walked up to me when, when he first got to Cleveland. So the picture of Webb and I sky jamming is in the big office. It's all over the stadium and all the, the suites. But it's in the you go in the big office upstairs, it's up there. And I don't know where Jarvis Landry, how he knows me, but he walked up to me and said, Hey Reggie, how you doing, sir? 
I go, hey man, how you doing? How you know me? You know, um, and we, we made friends. We made friends and then for the now, the last three years before every game, I walk up to him and make sure we shake hands. We show each other respect. I give him a little word of confidence. And most of the time I just tell him that I'm jealous. And he said, well, why are you so jealous? I said, cause you get to play football today. Yeah. He gets to play football today. So I'm living through him. He's, he is the guy that I really enjoy watching, having a good time. I really think Reggie, that trade for Jarvis. I mean, it, it changed in many ways, the culture in the sense that Jarvis brought an attitude and yeah, maybe he didn't win a lot in Miami, but his, his attitude, he just has a different type of mentality. Absolutely. And we didn't, we didn't have anybody on the team like that. So he came here and the first season we were fairly successful after going, Oh, and seven or Oh, and 16. And then, you know, the next season we had a little bit of a down year than of course last year, the playoff run. But since Jarvis has been here, it's been a different mentality. And I, I, I think it really started with him. And then of course now this year with Stefanski and Barry, but I know we get Chubb and all the other guys as well, but Jarvis kind of leads that charge in my opinion. And he, you know, I I, he deserves a lot of credit. 100%. I'm all with you with that. You won't get any, any negative from me. So last question for you. And I ask every guest this question. I love hearing the answer. You know, looking back at your career, what do you want Reggie Langhorn's legacy to be? I don't have a legacy. I don't have a legacy. I'm just a country boy from Smithfield. I had a chance to play with some fine men and some good coaches in a great city. There'll be a hundred more after me. Um, very uh, happy to have represented Brown and Orange um, with all I have. And, and I don't know, I ain't no, no leg leg legacy guy. Uh, yeah, it's cool. I, 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 don't, I don't know. People will remember me for whatever reason and however I cross their paths. You know, some may be somebody that met at a gas station. Um, some might be the little lady I used to go see before she passed away. Some may be there. Uh, in some restaurant I was nice to. Some maybe the, the, the drunken actions I, I did back when I was out there being a fool. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm my mother and father's son. My, my husband to my wife and grandfather to my newborn grandson of 40 days. <laughs> oh, congratulations. I didn't yeah, that. Thank you. Thank you. His name is James Simple. Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I can tell you from a Browns fan's perspective, you do have a legacy, and that is being one of the most beloved players and one of the most beloved teams in this city. And that's yeah, the truth. And when they hear Reggie Langhorn, Webster Slaughter, Bernie, I mean, you can go on and on, people light up. That's just how yeah. it is. It'd always be like that. So, I mean, you definitely have a legacy here. There's no question about it. Yeah, you know, I, whenever I think of when you, when you tie all the guys and all the names of, I would think of driving downtown before games with Webster. Webster and I always drove. If I drove, I like slow R&B. I was listening to slow R&B. If he drove in his web, web star Mercedes, he always listened to rap music from California. So <laughs> the rap was style. different every Sunday, right? <laughs> and, um, but coming down Ontario, because that's back when you could drive straight through and just looking at the buildings and all the gold brown signs and the, the, the stuff and the people in the, the, the noise and the excitement of the stadium. Uh, I think that's one vision that'll probably never leave my, my, my thought process about this city. Um, the city has been wonderful to me. Uh, I, I really have enjoyed being a part of Cleveland. Um, my wife will probably smack me upside the head when I say this. I always say Virginia is my home, but uh, Cleveland is where, 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 you know, where I live now and, and where I, I really do appreciate being a part of. So. Well, I guess you'll, you'll, home, huh? you'll always be a part of the history here. I mean, and that's just, that's, you know, again, you're one of the most beloved players of one of the most beloved teams. And that's just how it is. And I, I think that that era of Browns football will always be looked back and, you know, and just so many great memories for a lot of fans. So well, thank you. Monday after Sunday was great. Um, Reggie, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. You know, my oh, dad's going to be talking about this for hey, the next six months. <laughs> you're my man, son. You, you get a, you get a pass. Well, I appreciate <laughs> that. Really. I truly appreciate it. This has been awesome. I, I know there's a lot of Browns fans who can't wait to hear this. So thank you again. And we'll definitely be talking soon, Reg. Okay. Thanks. Good, Brad. Yeah, thanks. Good, baby. Take care. Take care. Okay.